the truck, I looked across and I saw this young mother. She was probably in her 20s. And she had a car seat, you know, the kind that you clip in and out. And the baby was just, the baby looked like it was old enough to almost come out of it. It's pretty, pretty, uh, I don't want to say fat baby, y'all, but you know what I'm saying. It's pretty thick baby was in that carrier. And uh, I can't say much because my wife always said the reason why she was strong was because we had it, all of our babies were fat. Love you, Justin. <laughs> And, uh, well, we could either say that was it. They were healthy. They were healthy babies. Anyway, so this mother had this care with this healthy baby, and uh, she had another child in tow. And this other child reminded me a lot of myself whenever I was little, the kind that goes, you know, mommy, 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 ask a million questions before you can answer the first one. Mom, what is this? What is that? What about that? You know. And as she got out of the car, seen her fighting this car carrier, trying to get it out. The door was trying to close on her, and she finally got the baby out and the other little girl, and she's conscientious about the other little girl, making sure the door didn't fall and, you know, slam on her. And, and the whole time, you know, she's, she's making her way up to the front of the uh, firehouse sub, and I watched her walk in. And, you know, it dawned on me what, what a sacrifice a lot of times, that the additional stress and strain that, mothers and women take on themselves, and I think back to my own wives. Just many, I cannot tell you enough how awesome of a, a mother that my wife was. Children never went out of the house looking like, as we call in the South, ragamuffins, and uh, they always were clean and taken good care of, and car seat didn't smell like sour milk, and she just took good care of them, and she showed her love, but she really took a lot on herself, and it really... Uh, reminded me of that, but especially when we got ready to leave, anybody that's ever gone to Firehouse Sub and you come out with that bag that they give you turned sideways with several boxes in it and all that, and you're trying to carry that. Here she came out. We, we came out before she did, and I was getting in my truck, and I looked up, and here she came out. She's got the one child in tow, and the whole time she's watching, just making sure, you know, where are we living today? you got to be so careful. And here she is. She got a bag in one hand with a box with some subs in it and a baby in the other arm, and she's trying to get in the car and fighting it all. And I thought, you know, those are the things that a lot of times people may not see, but the difficulties of just a small example of the many struggles in everyday life. Your child may never, you know, show the gratitude that, they, that you deserve when they get older or even as, as children. They may even scoff in your face as a teenager But sometimes life has a way of coming full circle. And when your children have children of their own, I say when your children have children of their own, they get older and get mature, and they start looking back and they realize just what mama went through. I can tell you that my own daughter, this isn't what I'm preaching, but I wanted to share this this morning with you. My own daughter had made a statement to my wife. She said, Mom, I know you do all that, but I can't do all that. Uh, we were discussing at one point, you know, about getting babies ready together, you know, and all that stuff Sunday morning and getting to church on time and being here and ready and all of that. And uh, with so many other things going on. And, and she said, Mom, not everybody's like you. <laughs> Praise God. But the truth is you grow into that. Mothers mature and they mold into that. They perfect, they perfect what they do. And my hat's off to every one of you. I want to apologize to you this morning that I did not have a big Mother's Day thing prepared for you today. We've had a lot of things going on with the Myers uh, residence. My wife, as most of you already know, she had a heart cath yesterday. A few days ago, she was at work, and she passed out at work and uh, with chest pain and that sort of thing. And, and knowing my wife, God bless you, honey, you can mute this part. But she's real stubborn about wanting to work and do, you know, just, you know, I'm fine kind of stuff. And so they didn't want her to leave, and she wanted to go home. So she left, and she got downstairs in the long hallway out the back of the hospital. She got so faint that she had to lay down in the middle of the floor. And those of you that know my wife, my wife don't lay down in the middle of the floor anywhere. <laughs> So, and then the uh, security guard or whatever came by and was looking at her with a real blank face. Uh, He seemed real compassionate from what I understand. But anyway, 
he uh, asked her what was going on, and she said, can you get me a cart or whatever. They ended up getting her cart. She rode the cart back to the car and drove home like that. Went back to work the next day. I didn't, I didn't want her to. She went back the next, next day and was weak and still having chest pains and uh, kind of leading up the same symptoms. So they ended up admitting her, and uh, they, they ran several tests, and so they thought they might have seen something on her uh, one of the scans for the stress test. Ended up, they decided to do the heart cath yesterday. Anybody ever had one of those? So she had a heart cath yesterday, and, uh, and actually it can be a very serious thing. People have died from it because of bleeding to death, heart attack, a lot of things. Um, but she is at home today, and she is recuperating. She, if it would have been up to her, she would be here this morning, and I'm like, look, I need you, you know what I mean? And you can't be bleeding to death or anything, so you got to stay right there. You could just watch from the house. You miss one service, it ain't going to hurt you, you know what I mean? So you pray for my wife. She is just unbelievable on this Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you, honey. You're the best wife a man could ever ask for and the best mother I could ever imagine. And uh, to the rest of you mothers, my hat's off to all of you for your many sacrifices and heartaches and hardships and things that no one will ever know about. I just want to say God bless every one of you. And if I can encourage you on this Mother's Day to do anything, sell out. Serve the Lord with every fiber of your soul that you can leave a great legacy for your children to follow. They may not always agree with everything that you do or say, but there'll come a time whenever they get older and they'll remember the legacy Mama left them. Amen. Stand to your feet this morning across the house of the Lord. I hope and pray I haven't missed anything. I didn't get out of the hospital last night with my wife until really late, and then I didn't sleep good because all I could think about all night long was checking on her as I felt like I woke up every few minutes and I said, are you okay? You all right? You feeling all right? And so I didn't feel like I got much sleep. And then this morning I taught Sunday school. So this is round two. You can ring the bell and uh, we're just going to see what the Lord's got in store. Didn't have as much time to energy to put into this as I normally do. But how many is going to pray the Lord to just have his way this morning? How many of you came to have church, not to just be seen, not to just, you know, show up, I came to feel something. I came to get something. Well, you came to the right place then this morning. John chapter 4, verse number 13. John chapter 4, verse number 13, 14, and 15. And uh, as it's already been mentioned, it's good to have everybody that's with us this morning. And beautiful folks. It's good to have the Muniz, Muniz, Muniz. How you, you probably heard it all, haven't you? Good to see them here this morning. Good to see Brother Richmond Mansell. He could talk the ears off of an elephant if you give him a chance. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Love you, Brother Richmond. Amen. So all the Mansell family, God bless y'all. Good to have you here. It's good to see Amber back with us again this morning. Give her a hand this morning as well. Let her know we appreciate her. And uh, those of you that are wondering, the piano, the keyboard that was broke, I did get it fixed. And uh, But this morning in the hustle and bustle trying to get everything together, I ended up leaving the house without it. So we do have it. Just got to bring it in. It's good to see Shane and Kirsten this morning. So I get it right. So I'm, I'm all good, right? We're back on it. We're back on the right page, right? Praise the Lord. And uh, it's good to see Sister Cindy, Nathan, and uh, young lady. I don't know what your name is. Shanna, good to have you with us. Praise the Lord. I have to remember your name as well. God bless you. Amen. John chapter 4, verse 13, 14, and 15. Now, if I miss somebody, please don't throw an egg at me. Amen. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water 
that I thirst not. Neither come hither, hither to draw. Skip down to verse 28 and verse 29. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? The message the Lord has laid on my heart to preach in this service this morning is just simply this. You can be kept if you want to be. Raise your hand to the Lord this morning and pray for God's will. Father, this morning we are thankful for the word of God. We ask you this morning to speak to this congregation that you have set before me. I pray, God, those that are here, those that listen through the broadcast ministry, I pray, God, that every heart will be ministered to in a special way. God, if they have come this morning for the purpose to hear what you have to say, I pray, God, that you will speak directly to their heart. They'll know exactly the mind and the will of God for their life before they leave. Use me as a messenger this morning. Not that this church or the world will see me, but they will see you through me. And we'll give you praise and glory and honor for everything that you do. And everyone can say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Preaching this morning on you can be kept if you want to be. I can tell you this morning that as I survey the history of my time of serving the Lord, looking back many years, Just like yourself, I have seen and I have experienced many, many things. I've watched people that have given their life, so-called give their life to God in the church for a while, and the next thing you know, they're back out of church. Some that say, I'm going to run with everything I've got, do this for a while, and then they fall by the wayside. But I'm confident this morning that it doesn't have to be that way. I'm confident this morning that God not only he will save you, but he also has the power to keep you. And I can tell you that as a child of God, I've even testified this many times over the years. Anybody besides me, whenever you've been given the opportunity to testify, you find yourself sometimes saying something similar or the same thing. And over the years when given an opportunity to testify, I've often talked about the keeping power of the Lord. You see, as an unconverted person, not living for the Lord, and I wasn't saved, by the time that I walked out of that lifestyle, gave my life to God, one of the most explosive and incredible things to me was not just the simple fact that God could save me, but the fact that God was able to keep me in this thing, that he had the power to keep me in the race. And I don't know about you, but just like myself, I look over my shoulder at my childhood and there were many ups and many downs and I felt like a failure in a lot of ways. Anybody else ever feel this way? I felt like that there were times of my life that I let my family down. And in some ways, I wanted my family to be impressed. I wanted them to think that I am actually somebody. I wanted them to realize I can do something. I'm not just a nobody. Well, in my attempts to prove to my family that I was somebody, sometimes I felt like that I dug my hole even deeper than it already was. I've had many times that I looked at myself in the mirror with pure, just utter disgust at who that I was as I tried to impress everybody. But I found that when I gave my life to the Lord, the thing that blew my mind was that God gave me the power to stay in this. If I wanted to keep running, I could. If I wanted to stay saved and serve the Lord, I could. I didn't have to fall in and fall out. I didn't have to get in and get out, fall on my face and walk away, as they say, with my tail tucked between my legs. I could get back up. I could go to the altar and I could give my life back to the Lord, rededicate myself to God if I had to, and I could continue to keep fighting and running in this race. That's the beautiful thing about God's mercy. Can you say thank God for that? But when I look at what is interesting in this story, and you see this woman who is at this well side, 
We find that Jesus uses something that is common, something that is typical to our everyday life, and that is water. Most of you, some of you may even have a bottle of water sitting close by. You already know without me making a big deal of it that water is something that you and I need that is imperative for the body for us to survive. We need that water. Water is used when a man gets sick. We want to make sure the man is hydrated. They may say make sure that he gets something to drink. If you go into the hospital and you become dehydrated, one of the first things they want to do, they want to make sure they get you rehydrated. I can tell you that it is imperative that the body stays hydrated. We need that liquid fluid that is inside of us from day to day. And yet the Lord chose on this particular day with an unlikely subject, a Samaritan woman that nobody else would have given probably the time of day. And that in itself is a whole other story. He comes along to her, a woman with a checkered past, a woman who has had several husbands, a woman with many ups and downs in life, a woman who may have done like me, Brother Steve, and tried to prove to my family I can get it together. I can do right. I can have a good life. Those that feel like they're on the downside, you're sliding down the the slope of life and you're not catching any ground anywhere. You can't get a foothold anywhere. Husband number five. And this unlikely subject shows up the same day that the Lord is at this well side that we call Jacob's well. There she comes in comfort. She comes into a meeting, if you will, with the master of all of glory, Jesus Christ. There he is on the well side. And when she meets him, she doesn't understand who she's even talking to. She doesn't realize the man that has the power to change her entire life. Do you know, I can remember that whenever I went to church, it was in 1997 in the month of August, I was invited to church. My grandmother invited me. Her name was Melver Grace. It was Ferndale Church of God. Joe Johnson was the pastor at that time. And I remember that my grandmother had tried to get me to go to revival. I was the kind of person that I was working from daylight to dawn. 12 to 16 hours a day was nothing. Any overtime that I could work, I was trying to work every chance that I got. And I remember that the Lord worked it out that night. I don't want to tell the whole entire thing, but God worked it out. My boss called me. He said, that job we were going to send you to, that overtime, he said, we're, that job fell through. And so, lo and behold, I'd already told my wife it also invited me. My wife was living with an unsaved jerk at the time. Might as well call it what it is. Amen. My wife was living with the devil at the time and so the Lord worked it out for me to be able to go to revival that night. I'd already told them now if I didn't have to work I'd go so now I've got my foot in my mouth and I've got to go. And so I show up that night and when I got there I didn't realize the same way that that woman who came to that well side I didn't understand what might just happen in that service that night. I have no intentions of going that night to get saved. I had no intentions of serving the Lord and I sure didn't have any intentions of ever preaching the gospel. I can tell you that. But my wife had been praying and asking God, save him. Save him Lord. You know the funny stories of the things that she put anointing oil in. She anointed everything. She went to her pastor at the time and said, what do I do? The pastor said, pray fast and anoint. Well, she went crazy with anointing oil. Put it in tea. Put it in my food. Put it on my truck, put it on my steering wheel, put it on my gas pedal, even put it on my side of the bed. Some of you, this is no new story, but I feel like preaching this this morning. Amen. But she put it on my side of the bed. And as a sinner, I remember I slept on one side of the bed every single night. It was my, anybody got their side of the bed? Well, one particular night just so happened uh, that she anointed that side of the bed. Well, I didn't know she anointed that side 
the bed, but I came to bed. I tossed and I turned and I rolled and I wrestled around. And finally I said, I can't get comfortable. I said, let me sleep on your side of the bed tonight. And uh, when she rolled over and got on my side of the bed, I heard her say, you sorry, devil. Hey, Amen. I didn't know she was talking about me. She could have been. I don't know. You got to ask her. Hey, Amen. But you know, uh, that's how that God worked it out over the course of time. But see, here I was in August of 1997, sitting in a church, not a big church, just a country church, if you will, out in the middle of what most would call nowhere. But I went to that church that night. I had no intentions of giving my life to God. I didn't know just like that unlikely Samaritan woman that came to the well side. I came in that night, I sat three pews back. I was almost about where Sister Farmer and Brother Farmer are, sitting in that church that night. S.J. Davis, Papa Davis, we call him, he was preaching that night and he preached a sermon on, amen, hell is no joke. Amen, the whole head bobbing and foam in the corner of his mouth. Those of you that know him know what I'm talking about. He'd bob ahead and preach. And I remember that night whenever he got to the end of that sermon, he looked over my way. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed and all of that. I remember, man, I had a white knuckle grip on the back of that pew. I, some of you don't know this, but I was in a place of my life. My marriage was on the rocks. Me and my wife were on the verge of divorce. She was praying, God save him, do something with him because she couldn't do anything with me. Amen. My life was a train wreck. Everything was falling apart. I had just lost a truck that got repossessed that I thought I had to have. Everything felt like it was falling apart. Amen. And so here we are, Brother Steve, standing in the midst of a crossroad in 1997. If I could take you all the way back there tonight and I could have a conversation with myself, I would say, go ahead, do it. Don't ever look back. Go ahead, go ahead. Amen. But I remember that I looked up from that everybody's head supposed to be uh, head bowed and eyes closed. And I remember looking up. Sister Manzel, I looked up and I saw the preacher looking at me. Worst thing in the world is to have a preacher looking at you whenever you're under conviction. And a preacher looking straight. I've had people tell me before, so I don't like to hear you preach. I said, why? Because you look at me when you preach. What you want me to do? Look at my shoes. Praise God. Amen. But brother, uh, brother Papa Davis looking straight at me and he looked and made eye contact and he said that's right son uh, you know the Holy Ghost is dealing with you come on down to this altar and you know that's all it took oh God all oh, the tears started flowing uh, you know sometimes we think we're too much of a man to cry but when you're about to lose everything you got you'll cry amen a muddy river if you got to because the spirit and the power of God's on your heart and on your life can anybody say thank God for conviction I miss uh, amen a lot of churches they ain't an ounce of conviction but I can tell you that I thank God for that old time conviction that'll get a hold of the heart and that heart said man I'm either going to run out or run to the altar and that night that's the way I felt I got up out of that pew hey amen some of you have done heard the story but maybe somebody else ain't I got up out of that pew and as I began to walk my wife she had the baby my daughter was already born and, and, uh, and Devin was just born and she took Devin and passed Devin to Christina who's now my sister-in-law and Christina passed the baby to somebody else amen next thing I know I'm down in the altar and sister Myers is right behind me amen and sister Christina and a whole bunch of folk praying for me and I had one thing on my mind that night brother Joyner and that was man if all these other folk can get it then so can I I thought to myself if God can save them he can save me too if God can give them salvation, why can't he do it for me? And that night in 1997, I sold out and I went all the way. Amen. By the time a few months went by, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And when God baptized me in the Holy Ghost, one night when he called me to preach, I knew that it was God. I thought, oh Lord, I wasn't raised in the church. Man, I could tell you some funny stories. Sitting around a Sunday school class with the canon girls who were in my class correcting me uh, that stuff 
because I thought I knew and they'll have to fix it and say, no, Brother Myers, Brother Joe, that's uh, so-and-so. I might call Stephen Stephan or Job Job. Amen, I was as green as a pea, but I was on fire for the Lord and I wanted to give God my everything. And I tell you, I didn't make it there by chance, but one night there was an unlikely meeting place and that's what took place in the life of this Samaritan woman. She came down to that well side and the Lord was going to make a spectacle but in a good way. He was going to tell the entire nation. Even Samaritan people can get help. Even people with a checkered past can get help. You say, Pastor, I've done this and I've done that. My family disowned me. This one don't like me. This one don't care for me. And I got some excess baggage and I got this and I got that. Let me tell you somebody. You might have fell in and fell out. But there's one good thing about grace. God can just save you. But God can also keep you. You might be here struggling by the wayside. And you may say, Pastor, I've done tried it and tried it. Honey, get all the way in this thing and try it one more time. Because you got heaven to gain and hell to shun. And in the end of this race, it'll be worth it. Can somebody say amen to me this morning? Somebody raise your hand and give God praise this morning. Amen. But the Lord used that sustainability of water. And we all know that we're dependent upon water. And what Jesus was trying to let this woman know, there is so much in this life that you might try to depend on. I know you're the water girl. I know you're at the bottom of the labor pool. I know you've came today to get water for your household. And everybody else maybe is too lazy to do it. But here, little girl, let me tell you something. When you leave here today, you don't know it yet, but you're going to leave your water pot on the well side and you're going to take the whole well with you today. I would to God that there be somebody to come to the house of God. Amen. That'll leave their water pot on the side of the well and go home with the whole well supply. Here's what I'm telling you. You ain't got to settle for just a few trinkets of this world. I know that some of you may have tried to fill your life with riches and goods and in in this thing and that relationship but let me tell you at life's end take it from somebody that's been there there ain't no drug there ain't no alcohol there ain't no relationship there ain't nothing in this world there ain't no career move that'll ever take the place of the peace of God that passes all understanding amen when you're laying in the bed at night amen I can tell you that peace will do something that your boyfriend can't that peace will do something that the world can't that peace it'll do something that the almighty dollar can't do that peace will do something that meth and crack can't do say amen somebody I'm glad this morning to have the peace speaker living on the inside he said I've got something that you need young woman how many this morning understands that a lot of folks have tried a lot of things and they find themselves going down a rocky path but I know this morning when I look at this young woman amen has come by the well side at a place of her life maybe vulnerable he used water to prove to her her need Pastor Myers, how did he do that? Well, when I read the scripture, it said that this woman looked to him. The Bible said, verse 14, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give in him will be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Come on now. I'm telling you, it is a perpetual and a continual supply. You say, Pastor, I tried to serve the Lord and I didn't feel that. Well, it's time you get back down to the well. I said, it's time you get back down to the well because he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And that same good Holy Ghost power you fell in the altar however many years ago, it is the same power that is real today. That same anointing that you felt come all over you till your hands started shaking and your lips started quivering. It's the same good Holy Ghost power that it's always been. Say, man, somebody, don't change. Don't exchange the world's goods for the power of the Lord and the power of the Spirit in your life because there ain't nothing worth it. Amen. What's the Bible said? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? 
all the gold, all the money in Fort Knox, all the best relationship, all the best career, but at the end of life's race and you're laying there in a hospital bed, maybe eat up with cancer, and you realize, uh, I can't take all of these things in the casket with me, and even if I do, I can't wake up on the other side with them. Uh, I can tell you there's something you can take past the gate of glory, and it is the presence of God in your life. Can you say amen? I just want you to understand this morning that what the Lord did in here, in her, I'm going to tell you just simply, you can be kept if you want to. Why would you say that, Pastor Myers? Now, I don't know exactly how this woman's relationship went. I don't know if it was abusive husbands or men that she was with that she gave the boot. But most likely, culturally, if you look at the culture of that day, she had been what we call in America kicked to the curb several times already. I'm glad I serve a God that ain't going to kick me or you to the curb. You may walk out the front door, but he ain't going to kick you to the curb. You get tired of trying relationship after relationship, and it don't work. I'm just through. I'm done. I, I don't want to see another man. I, I just don't want to see another woman. I, I, you know, I've even heard some of them joke around. I mean, it ain't really a joke, but I've heard them say it. I think I'm going gay. Come on, I'm just telling the truth. I, I, I can tell you this much this morning. Little woman at the well. Now you done tried so many other things. You got to wonder when you've been in five relationships like that already. How long is this one going to last? When you give your life to God, you can be kept if you want to. You don't have to fall by the wayside. I'm going to tell you there's enough keeping power in the spirit of God to hold you upright. You say, Pastor, I just can't help myself. I don't know what to do. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. I can tell you it didn't matter if you're a prostitute working the streets of downtown Orlando. I serve a God that can straighten you up and straighten you out. He said, Pastor, I was the world's biggest drug dealer. Hey, man, they ain't got nothing on me, these drug lords over in the cartel. I was a big time drug dealer. I don't care. It doesn't make no difference. Uh, but I can tell you this. Uh, he can save the lowest of the low, the worst of the worst. Uh, and if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I'd like to serve God, but I don't know what to do. Can I tell you the best thing you could do if you're standing up on the dock uh, and you're looking down at the water and you're getting ready to maybe jump in. Don't just jump part way in. Honey, jump all the way in this thing. If you're going to get it all, you got to go all the way. That's where a lot of times folks mess up because we want just a little bit of God, just a little religion, just enough to get rid of this nagging conscience and conviction. When Jesus painted a picture of this woman's life, he painted a picture of a woman on a canvas of our mind. Maybe times of trouble, times of discouragement, maybe even times of hurt. Anybody that's been through that, it's pretty obvious. And worst of all, she's still going through it. It's not over. Currently, as he's speaking to her, it's still going on at the house. While I'm talking to some of you this morning, you may even be watching online, you know that God's been dealing with you to fully sell out. My question this morning is, what is it that is stopping you? Well, Pastor, he might not catch me if I fall. I might mess up. 
Well, if you were watching online, if I was to pan around this room, I could show you a whole room full of people that's done messed up. But pastor, I just don't know, and my family's going to think this, and once I tell them I got saved, boy, they're going to expect all kinds of stuff out of me. I got one question to ask you this morning here. Who, if you serve God, who are you doing it for? You're not serving God for your daddy, your mama, your grandparents, Pastor Myers. You either get in this thing and serve the Lord because you love the Lord and you want to serve God and you know what is right, or either you don't. Halfway religion is going to make you a miserable person. Well, so, Pastor, I just want to... I just want to put one foot in. Can I just do that? Will you just leave me alone? Let me put one foot in. I will let you put one foot in. I'm going to preach the other foot in too. Pastor, I just, if you just leave me alone, just don't bother me. I mean, I'll keep coming to church and I will, I mean, I might even throw a few dollars in all. Just let me leave my one foot in here. I will let you leave your one foot in there. But every time I get a chance, I'm going to tell you about the love of God you could be experiencing if you just move that little other foot a little bit farther the other way. Because the difference is, uh, is at some point you got to make a change uh, that you realize what you need uh, is at that well side and is name is Jesus. Uh, Everything that I need to sustain me is in Christ Jesus. Uh, And she realized that day uh, and she went back to town and said, come see a man. Uh, You see, I've been with a bunch of boys. But come see a man. (laughs) You want to find you a good husband? Uh, Find you a Christian child of God, a man sold out to serve the Lord. I'm not saying uh, that God can't change a man, but I can tell you the greatest man you could ever be yoked to is a man that loves God with all of his heart uh, because whenever a man loves God with all of his heart, he's got a dual purpose. Uh, It is to please God and to be pleasing to that wife. Uh, And I tell you, it's what makes my marriage so beautiful. It's because the love of God that is in me. I see something in my wife and nobody doesn't see. When I look at her, I see something nobody else sees. My Lord, when she looks at my way, she sees something nobody else. She's got to, folks. Come on now. I told him the other day, I said, I'm going to start giving young men good advice. I mean, it's about time to do that anyway, right? You know what I mean? It's about time for me to start giving young men looking for a long-term relationship with a wife, good advice. And I'm re- you ready for this? This is, this is my good advice. Men, young men, find a woman who will stay with you until you turn into a man. Find a woman that will put up with you until you turn into a man. As I look back over my childlike spending and times my wife couldn't pay a bill because I blew it on something I shouldn't have spent it on. Well, the cable's going to get turned off. What? Well, you had to have that car stereo. I mean, what you want me to tell you? Huh? Immature ways. Acting all crazy. Jumping out of cars. Yelling at people in the middle of the road. Get out of the way. Get back in the car, her hanging her head down, shaking her head. You're going to get yourself killed one of these days. I, my wife had to put up with this old sorry joker here till I got saved and turned into a man. And I want to tell you something. I know that whenever the Lord saw this situation, that what this woman had experienced, this was going to be, as my mama would say, totally different. This was going to be something like this woman had never experienced in all of her life. I'm telling you, the only thing that I regret about salvation is that I did not give my life to God sooner than I did. Had I known it would be like this, I'd have gave it a long time ago. I look back by the Benefield and I remember my grandmother trying to witness to me. She said, Joey, you need to serve the Lord. You need to get your children in church and you need to serve God. Hey, can I tell you, it blows my mind to know that on my grandma's dying deathbed and she held my hand with that hand of hers and that wrinkled up skin. 
had got thin and blackness uh, covered the top of her hand uh, and she held me with that trembling hand uh, looked me in the face and said I'm proud of you Joey let me tell you amen nobody will ever take that away from me because my grandma's one of the ones that told me you need to give your life to God uh, and yet one day I'd have never known it uh, coming down that dirt road to their house uh, you'd hear grandma she'd have that you remember them old stereos with the big tower speakers uh, I mean it had a record player and a cassette player and an equalizer and I mean it was this tall my grandma had one of them things and big old tower speakers uh, I'd be coming down the dirt road uh, I probably couldn't preach I probably still can't preach but amen, grandma had that old cassette tape of her grandson blaring I could hear myself preaching coming down the dirt road uh, I got to my grandma's house and I looked around where grandpa was he out in the backyard I come around there and I said hey grandpa I said I had to get out here away from your grandmama he said she got you in there screaming I can't hear a thing praise God let me tell you folk uh, I can say thank God uh, that God turned my life around he made a change uh, is there somebody this morning that says pastor I am ready for something different in my life I'm tired of it being like this I'm tired of the way things have been. I'm tired of the way it's gone. I'm ready for God to turn something around for his glory. Until you get to that place and you finally make that decision, you can only expect things to continue to be just like they've been. You can say, Pastor Myers, I I really just, I just want a case of the do-betters. Well, those don't usually last very long. One foot in and one foot out don't last long. Making a final decision. You've probably heard me say this before, but I believe this with everything within me. I know our modern day American homes are a lot different than they were probably whenever some of us were younger. But I believe that a man is supposed to be the head of his house. I'm not talking about a dictator or a tyrant. I'm talking about a man being in a leadership role of his house. And I believe this morning that if you can turn the head, you can turn the whole body. And daddies should not leave mama to drag their children to church, try to give them the best. Daddy should take the initiative. Daddies need to take the initiative to step up because I can tell you It's a lot easier to point children in the right direction when daddy makes the choice to serve the Lord. Brother David Mobley, I know you're here. You've told me your testimony before and what the Lord's done and everything, and I I believe that your daughters have confidence in you and your wife as well. But there's just something about when daddy gets saved. Daddy gives it all to God. The harmony of the home has the ability to change completely. I had someone here recently that told me, I mentioned this in Sunday school if I'm not mistaken, their marriage was, I've had many, many conversations with many people in the last couple of weeks and believe it or not, it's probably at least six or seven different marriages of people that I've talked to that are absolutely on the brink of divorce, falling apart. And I can tell you the easiest way to fix a marriage is for it to become a godly marriage. You may say, Pastor, I'm doing my best, just like your wife did. Keep doing it. My wife and I I've had the opportunity to counsel with and encourage young couples, other people that have gone through the same thing. My wife prayed for a long time that the Lord would save me. I kept chasing after my own thing. But through the prayers of my wife, the answered prayers, God got a hold of my heart. I can tell you this. If you're the woman at the well and you want the people back at home or back in the town to believe and convince that this is the best way, 
you better live like it is. Because they're watching every move you make. They're watching the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you act. Let them see it through you. I want to encourage you to get down on the altar, and I mean get as full of God as you possibly can so that when you come up there, you understand within yourself he's not just a saving God. He's a keeping God. If I fall by the wayside, Pastor, that wasn't God. It wasn't his fault. That was my fault. He stands just like a prodigal son's father with his arms open. I'm going to ask the farmers to come get ready and play something this morning as I attempt to close. As I look around the world today, my heart breaks to see so many people going through so many adverse situations. Tragedy abounds on every hand. Heartbreak. There was a song that groups sang years ago I'm trying to think of their name. Starts with an M, but they sing a song, and it's called There Is a Remedy. And the song says, There's a remedy for the sin sick soul. Do you know what this woman experienced down at that well side? Was what the United States of America needs, whatever home needs, and that is a personal experience with you and the Lord. You might say, Pastor, I'm, I'm kind of sick with religion. Join the club. I'm not inviting you to get yoked up with religion this morning. I'm, get, I'm inviting you this morning to have a deeper personal relationship with the Lord himself, to serve him with everything within you. Not just a shallow surface salvation. As I mentioned in Sunday school, not just a picture of the Last Supper on your living room wall, a dusty Bible on a shelf, but to sell completely out is you and the Lord. As every head is bowed and eyes closed across this church this morning, I'm going to invite you right now in the name of Jesus to this altar and you say, Pastor, I'd like to talk to the Lord this morning, just me and him. If that's you, you say, Pastor Myers, I really, really need to have a talk with the Lord. I've been going through so much. You could have been raised in this all of your life. You say, Pastor, I, I'm a preacher's kid, or my parents have been godly people all of their life. Let me explain to you this morning. You've got to get this thing for yourself. You be here this morning, you say, Pastor, I've been in and I've been out, I've been up and I've been down. Sometimes I feel like.